Rub up your engines! Fossil 1987 says, Scotty, love your channel. I got a Ford 1.8 Duratec 2004 gasoline manual car with 90,000 miles. For the past few months, it's been giving off an eggy smell from the exhaust. Struggles to accelerate. We've had new cat, spark plugs, coils, battery. We can't figure out what the problem is. I cleaned the throttle and helped it for a little while. Eggy smell is sulfur. There's only two things that can make eggy smell. And you're sure it's coming from the exhaust. Stick your nose in there, smell it. Make sure it's coming from the exhaust because batteries can also do it with sulfur smell coming off the, an old bad battery in a car lead acid battery often you can smell kind of sulfur when they're going bad make sure it's not the battery but if it's definitely coming from the exhaust you have two high sulfur in the fuel that you're buying. Now you said you put a new cat in. Make sure you only got one cat because some of those things have two cats. If they have two cats, the other cat's bad because the sulfur gets in and it makes that egg smell. But if you change the cat and you're still getting an egg smell, it has to be the fuel you're buying. Let's say you're like me and you're lazy. Where am I going to buy my gasoline? Generally the closest place to my house because I'm lazy. Maybe you've been going to the closest place to your house and they have crappy gasoline with high sulfur content. Go someplace else and if you find it goes away and it runs fine go to the other station and stay away from that they got cheap gas i see that all the time from you know mom and pop stations that are buying gas from wherever the gas will smell a sulfur coming out of the back of the tailpipe because it's making the sulfur burn and it also degrades the catalytic converter so i don't know how long ago you bought that catalytic converter but if you are getting bad gas you could be ruining your new catalytic converter too but like i say make sure if you got more than one cat change the other one too many cars have two some even have three or four cats on them daily on 95 six says scotty i just saw the video you did on the metal oil canister just wondering where i can look it up for 2012 camry mine has that stupid plastic cheap canister that looks much better it's called baxter performance usa.com just go there and you can look it up and it is a solid steel piece with all the gaskets just take off the old one this bolts on there's a socket on the end so you get it nice and tight and then you get a regular toyota oil filter that spins on and off and you'll be really happy it's a real quality product no they're not cheap they're like 199 bucks but i mean hey you want to ruin a car because of stupid plastic thing if i had one that had a canister like that that's the first thing i would put on but my cars are so old they're all just spin on and off oil filters anymore and from my knowledge they don't make them like that anymore people got so mad at toyota all the later ones that i've worked on had regular spin on filters again they learned that their customers didn't like that crap it's a good thing all right here we go crazy modern designs now the feds are or what they call reaching out to Tesla over the new Model S steering wheel. It's a yoke design. So it's like half a steering wheel, more like an airplane. They're wondering whether this is a safe thing to sell to the public. And now you make one that's like this. It very well could confuse people. They could get their hands stuck in a yoke or something. They'd miss a turn. I kind of agree with the feds of this one. hundred something years, everybody's using round steering wheels. Why change something that works? Now, of course, Tesla wants to look futuristic, so they want to make it look more like an airplane, you know. At least they still got a steering yoke and they're not going by a joystick, because I mean, at least the steering yoke is there you can grab the thing and turn it if you got a joystick and it breaks then you turn it and it runs into a tree well that wouldn't be too happy at least it's something you can grab and still turn when you drive real fast you might be sliding your hand on a circle well if you're sliding on the bottom of a circle and then a top is gone because it's only half a circle you could easily get hit i can see a problem people might have with them elegus 1966 says i got a 2011 toyota corolla got an oil leak it's on the back side of the engine on the passenger side could it be the time Timing chain tensioner. Could be a head gasket. Well, what you want to do is put some UV leak dye. I've got a video finding, fixing car oil leaks. You put the ultraviolet leak dye in, drive it around for a half an hour, then you get these yellow sunglasses and a UV light. AutoZone has places, kits like 25, 30 bucks or something. And if you see the green dye coming down, oil goes by gravity. So it goes down. So if you follow the line up to where it comes from, odds are it's the timing chain tensioner. Those things leak all the time on those things. Check it out. But do the test first. The test never lies. Because like my father told me ages ago at his corner gas station, don't ever tell somebody you can fix something in 10 minutes because you might have more than one leak. You might have two or three leaks. You got to find every single one of them before you say the job is done. And with a UV leak, that's going to find any leak you possibly have. Lopez 8624 says, I was wondering if it's recommended 
had to clean the brake dust on the pistons and brake calipers when changing out pads. My friend told me I should when I put new pads on. I've never heard this. Well, the piston goes out to squeeze the pads. And if you got a dual system, you got a piston on each side, right? But over the piston is a rubber dust cover. And inside the piston is a rubber piston ring that seals the fluid from leaking out. As long as the rubber cover that covers the piston isn't ripped or torn, you don't have to do anything. You know, it doesn't need anything. The dirt's only on the outside. I mean, if it's covered with crud, you might as well clean it off. It's rubber. And if you keep covered with dirt forever, who knows? But it's not anything you necessarily have to do. If you see it's ripped and torn, you want to replace it or replace the whole caliper or something with a remanufactured one. If you look up north where it's all rusted and crudded and everything's worn out for safety. Places like AutoZone, you can often get a rebuilt brake caliper for like 50 bucks. They don't cost anything so you might as well check it out this three ton porsche 911 carrera is the only bulletproof porsche ever made which is kind of surprising because you would assume there'd be a lot of bulletproof porsches because people that drive them are rather obnoxious and there's probably a lot of people that want to get even with them and are mad at them you'd think be a lot more of them that were bulletproof now the problem of course is it turns it into a three ton porsche from all the weight of the glass it has dragonfly turquoise metallic paint. I think it's kind of a weird color, but you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? It has 20 millimeter thick bulletproof glass. Now, even though it weighs three tons, to keep the weight down, they used a special material called Dyneema. It's a composite fabric to make it bulletproof. The doors and everything. And it still had the stock engine, so it wouldn't be all that fast with all that weight. And a manual transmission, interestingly enough. It's in a Porsche museum, and it never left a Porsche collection. Nobody actually bought it. It is a one-off. And I'm sure after somebody got in it and tried driving around with all that weight, they probably would have said, hey, this thing is a dog. That little bitty six-cylinder engine pulling all that weight. <laughs> so it's probably a good thing nobody actually bought it. They wouldn't have been able to race away from that many people with all that weight. Reno 9 says, what do you think of a Renault Clio? I don't know if they sell them in the USA, but it's a great car. It's underrated. I bought it. I thought it was a pile of crap because it was so cheap, but I was shocked. It's now on 379,000 miles I've had. Very little problem. What do you think of it? They don't sell them in the United States, but like you say, you bought it, you thought, what a crappy little car. But then it kept running, and that's exactly what they are, crappy little cars that can run. There's a lot of crappy little cars out there, in the past at least, that ran a really long time. They didn't ride well, they didn't much pick up, they made a lot of noise, they were bumpy when you hit bumps, but they still went down the road. Some of the Yugos are still going, <laughs> and you know, they were Italian Fiats that the Yugoslavians bought the molds and built them in Yugoslavia, but then when they had that or they blew up the factory and that was the end of that. But there's still some of them going along. And those East Germans are driving around those Trabant's pieces of crap. I believe the engines were the starter motor for a Russian tank. But if that's all you got, you're going to drive it around and Pete's walking. <laughs> Check it out. This is a 630 horsepower racing postal truck. Yeah, it's the only postal truck in the United States that's in a hurry to get somewhere. <laughs> now, the stock one had a 2.5 liter Iron Duke engine that couldn't go any faster than 65 miles an hour. So this guy put a Corvette LS1 engine in it, and it goes a lot faster than that. The man bought it from a woman who was ready to retire working at the post office, and it has a right-hand drive because it was a rural postal truck, but he put it in a six liter LS engine and a 6L90 transmission and he's also planning on ported so with a blower it's going to put up 750 horsepower. Now the fastest he's running the drag is 108 miles an hour not all that fast. It is a giant postal truck. <laughs> He has events. As a matter of fact, he's going down to Houston, so you might be able to see the only postal truck in the world that's actually being driven in a hurry. Brad C. says, Scotty, I bought a Lexus ES 300. 1999. It was running great. 125,000 miles. The camshaft position sensor went out, not cranks poorly. Is it an interference engine? Okay. One, it is not an interference engine. All the ES 300s were non-interference engines. The only other real interference toy engines were the V8s that they put in the Tundras and stuff. Those were all interference engines with rubber timing belts. I think it's kind of a dumb design, so, uh, but that's on the only two that they ever really used interference engine is for Toyota. Now, it changed the camshaft position sensor. It's not that big of a deal. Just bolts on and off. You can go to AutoZone. They'll show you on a computer where it is. They can even print you out directions, and they can sell you one cheap enough. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.